Good morning and welcome to this, the uh, second part of a three-part webinar series around the theme of adaptation is the only precedent. Uh, my name's Craig, this is Simon, we're from a brand of growth agency called Big Blue. Thanks to those of you who um, uh, engaged with us after the last session uh, with questions and queries um, and we're really happy to um, have your diary time. Hopefully you've got a cup of coffee for the next 15-20 minutes to talk about adaptation. Um, we'll run through three uh, slides from, uh, from last week which are kind of the summary beats of the session. Uh, a quick recap if you like is what we really talked about and and the heart of our conversation last week, and those of you who'd like to reference it, if you haven't seen the, the, the webinar, it's up on YouTube and also the deck is shared via uh, the Fragrance Foundation. So thank you very much to, to Linda and team for that, is trust. Trust is the um, art and science of brand building. Um, it really assumes the uh, classic understanding of everything from interpersonal dynamics to uh, behavioral psychology um, and ultimately for people to go out into the world, to work together, to look to achieve anything, they can only do it if they recognize they have each other's backs and they understand each other, they can empathize and relate to each other, um, they can mirror each other's values, they can fundamentally and essentially trust each other. Uh, so brand building is about relationship building and that all falls over if you can't trust it. Sure, and I think uh, all of us will observe in these, um, in these times that actually as the weeks go on, the idea of trust, the idea of building trust, the necessity for it, and the different dimensions of trust are becoming even more and more prevalent, more and more important. You know, actually it feels in many ways like the trusted institutions are being, you know, bits are being ripped away from them day by day. So actually looking to brands, looking to institutions and trying to be part of a narrative around trust is even more important, where actually, sadly, when trust is being eroded for one, it's being trusted, it's mm. being eroded for all. So actually, it's a bigger focus than yeah. we ever thought it would be. Well, you know, the, the usual hackneyed lines like shifting sands means ultimately that, you know, the, the ground upon which we stand feels very shaky. And that was an accidental mm. metaphor in there. But when there is an erosion in institutional trust, when there is a time of such uncertainty, what do you hold on to and what feels foundational and firm? Uh, and, and it really does come back to trust, which is why we looked to build out our trust model mm -hmm. um, that became a, a hopefully a helpful and actionable reference point for uh, our clients uh, and for uh, other brand practitioners uh, who are very welcome to have a look at it too. It's a bit nebulous to say, oh, you know, trust is important, let's build trust. And how do you do it? How do you break it down in ways that are simple and accessible? And it is everything from, and this is again a bit of a recap from the previous session, but important as our kind of kickoff point here today. Um, deeds and words, uh, actions speak volumes, words in and of themselves are fine, but they have to be followed up. Um, then there's a piece around reinforcement, frequency and repetition, and really, really that comes down to the idea of consistency. Um, never actually sort of going silent for too long, and what, what you say and how you say it has to never ultimately challenge, undermine or create uncertainty in the eyes and the minds of the audience, um, based on what you said previously. And one of the, one of the feedback comments from last week from uh, one of the uh, one of the views of the webinar then was the idea that within fragrance specifically many of the houses have long legacy mm -hmm. um, you know enormous amounts of legacy in terms of business practice but also cultural practice yeah. so actually how do you make sense of those and what do you do with those to unpack or make a virtue of them moving forward i think the view we're going to take today is going to be highly focused on one of the core points from from, from last week which is about the opening up of, of supply chains and moving away from supply chains being about logistics and trucks but actually being um, about open source uh, branding open source business and the fact that actually right now um, I guess previously to build trust if we work with brands in the past it's mm -hmm. like you, you you say the right thing you put the right systems in place yeah. you have the right the right trust marks as Kevin Roberts yeah. would have said back in the Saatchi days but actually now everything's under scrutiny you know, actually you can do all the positive work over in one area of philanthropy or social mm -hmm. uh, cohesion, but actually if your supply chain breaks down and there's some problem with your ingredients, mm -hmm. your trust will be eroded. So never has it been more important to make sure you have, you know, not necessarily limited to seven points on, mm -hmm. on, on, oh, on, on a split mix, yeah. but actually everything is up for scrutiny and everything should be up for scrutiny to ensure that you're building trust with customers moving forward. Yeah. It's, it's about building that legitimate narrative absolutely. Uh, and absolutely recognized uh, that many of the fragrance brands uh, are long-standing. They have all sorts of traditions, heritage, and legacy that is baked in with all kinds of positive attributes, uh, and are, are there to be kind of captured and projected forward. But that's the point: that the tradition and the legacy becomes a backstory timeline that needs to connect up with this moment in time and then trend forwards. Uh, and, and so, thinking in terms of those those macro narratives and how the story unfolds in ways that are consistent but evolving. Um, 
provides almost a point of reassurance in part as well, because ultimately then it's not a case of having to divorce from the past in any way, but actually look to the past and look at the, at the back piece, about the backstory, to sort of set that kind of torch bearer for the future. Sure. So it plays through on the story. And I think story in line. observation last week about anticipation, the idea that actually the market and the world is a very different place to what it was only six months ago. So actually change has become more rapid. Yeah. Actually today we want to talk a bit more about the positives of moving out of this. What are the rules of engagement? How can one move forward? What should we be looking at? And what are some of the clues for areas that you can start opportunity spotting really? Um, so yes. <laughs> but very simply, antitrust is anti-branding. Um, so we need to ultimately look to very much work out how to create those those trust narratives that are consistent with the past and, and project forward. And we reference one one further slide which sort of bridges the gap between the anticipation and anticipate and adapt but actually we'll pull through into grow because what we look at here is the idea of anticipating a future ecosystem and again we talked about in the past maybe your communication could do everything to build trust it mm -hmm. could feel like you were trusted you were in the right places the right institutions you had the right sort of state and the kind of approach yeah. to things but actually now we look at um, this Sputnik for areas of interrogation. So the behaviours, legacy models, frameworks and behaviours are going to define your future. Mm -hmm. Which areas do you need to be adapting in across media and communications, retail and you know, what we're seeing in the newspaper even from yesterday and the opening up of stores is actually retailers whilst sort of scrambling to get it right aren't necessarily adapting to a new model. Mm -hmm. Primark is still having people coming through the store to buy things at a till point. Sure. That's sure. not an adaptation for a modern world. You know, they haven't spent the last uh, seemingly sort of 12, 10 weeks actually upping their mm. digital presence, yeah. using tools and techniques to get there. So actually, this is a way of looking at your brand at the heart of it, the behaviours your brand should be um, uh, imbibing and using as a filter for how you behave in the marketplace. So again, it's a reference slide more than anything else, but we'll come and think about that filter that everything should be looked through a bit, a bit later mm -hmm. on. I mean, for me this is all about making it a bit easier. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and yes, the, the retailers are, are currently practicing uh, a, a sort of a, a set of approaches that are really holding on to old practices, mm -hmm. you know, almost a little bit too tightly rather than, and at best looking to evolve them by degrees. This is very much about putting your entire business, everything from your brand through to all your operational structure, under the right kind of self Composed microscope to establish how to evolve healthily and happily and quickly. Well, it might be contentious, but I, I was particularly sort of put off by the language that everyone was trying to adopt to the new normal. The fact that actually people were striving for a normal, where actually the sure. chance now is now to just have new and different as opposed well, to can we just get back to normal? Sure. But actually, normal is gone, uh, totally. and, and those who yeah. embrace something completely different will mm. probably shine through. Mm. And, and, and you know, this sort of this, this wrestling between new normal or old different, what's changing, what's the same. I, I think there's some you know health, healthy anchors we can we can drop within this as well. Yes, there is a lot of change uh, across technology, society, culture, the media, um, the sciences. Um, that would have happened irrespective of what's happened as an accelerated piece within 2020. But within the context of this, this kind of balance between constancy and change, I think it's healthy to also recognise what constants are. We, what we're really talking about here is sort of change within the frame, within the frame of a few things that are actually pretty irrefutable and rock solid. Um, and particularly what, you know, what we're talking about here is the whole idea of you know, human nature, our key motivators, our drivers, how depending on our particular circumstances, we either ladder up or ladder down through Maslow's hierarchy uh, accordingly. Um, you know, our, our, what ultimately drives us, what we want, what we desire, what we stand in pursuit of, um, the kind of you know, memories and legacies we want to leave, the mark we want to make on the world. These things are constants and understanding those motivation triggers is also as a, as a key piece of the puzzle, but also a helpful kind of reference point to keep saying within building out plans. And I think this is to take out for me, which is the springboard into the future, that if there's something which has been put under much more of a spotlight and scrutiny, we know on the bottom right hand side of this slide that actually people's needs, which will, will I think are not going to change. People will look back at the times of COVID, Black Lives Matter, this, is, this enormous shift in terms sure. of how we see the world and want to be looking at how they can stand out, to love and be loved. Yeah. And actually sort of dialed up to be more and more important. You know, and the idea of a more enlightened version of ourselves, which is a behaviour which mm. be, you know, is not new, but sure. actually the fact that people want to feel like they're doing something new. And that could be people who are trying to change work. Yeah. If people are looking to brands to provide more in their lives rather than less and actually can enhance their existence yeah. is kind of what we're looking Well, core self is core self and fundamental drivers are fundamental, but you're absolutely right that this is a, a brief moment of time. This is creating an individual, cultural and, and global moment of pause for reflection as to what 
are the more important and you know prioritized values and how we therefore should actually look to you know, to to strive towards being that better sure. superior version and, of ourselves and, and then if we link back to the previous slide for those who are allowed to look at it um who download later on you start looking at media behaviors your policies how you work with people and so this whole thing dovetails sure. um, very very much very neatly i'm um, so placing a few bets in, in terms of that balancing act between change and constancy um, we, we published a white paper at the beginning of, of spring um, where, you know, of course there are going to be clearly winners and we've all seen a lot of those clearly winners start to emerge uh, within, our, within our very different kind of 2020 from the broadband content streaming operators, the conferencing providers, social media, clearly winners. But if you start to sort of, sort of game theory it out to those broader concentric circles and the, the players that will start to emerge and become far more mainstream front and centre and used by people in their everyday lives. So Certainly, you know, the, the industry of, sort of behavioral modeling, new med tech players will emerge, wearable tech, geolocation, IoT, they're absolutely going to kind of create these kind of interesting intersections and crossovers at, with new use cases emerging and within retail, clearly, because of also grafting on the sort of the current social concerns and anxieties of the day, the whole kind of resetting of frictionless shopping and touchless technologies um, are going to get their, their, their second invention, if you like. But I guess the idea is if, if you're looking to adapt to, to a sort of slightly unknown future, to adapt you need to team, team up with partners mm. who can allow you to do that in the best way, can answer Absolutely. the big questions, can That's allow right. you to be more adaptive. I mean, th these, these elements of first party data, the idea of um, you know, transparent supply chains, mm. these kind of themes, are not new, sure. but these are hoverboard moments where it's just going, this is not far off trajectory stuff. This is stuff you could have today. Mm -hmm. This is, it's enabled, yeah, yeah. it's there, Absolutely. it's accessible. And, and much of it doesn't mean enormous amounts of capex. It's a small shift in terms of how you, you're presenting yourself as an organization. Mm -hmm. And I think what we want to get onto uh, a little bit later on today is the genuine power of supply chains and how they're coming to the forefront and, and how we need to think about them in a totally reinvented mm -hmm. way. Absolutely. Yeah, the very simple questions that, as you say, have sort of been lingering, not really top of mind, but sort of there in the background for a lot of, you know, a lot of consumer segments, um, as well as, as brands, uh, you know, this notion of where do things come from, who's touched them, you know, what are, who are the hands that have touched them along the way, where are things source, provenance, ingredients, integrity of uh, brand safety, issues that were important, but now feel profoundly and acutely real and immediate to people. I mean, once you say it really, the potential, if you might flip it back one slide, sure. is that, that supply chain should probably not be called that. Sure. Because it isn't supply means just forward trajectory. Actually, it's, it should maybe have a new name. Mm. It's just about, I don't know, business link or yeah. business chain. Or, so because actually it's, it's the brand, it's the people, it's the product, it's the ingredients, it's the sourcing. It's, it's an everything chain. It's oh, not just supply and stuff, yeah. traditional what it was, there it is. It's supply chain has this sort yes. of semantic connotation that pigeonholes it mm -hmm. in one sort of understanding, one sort of conversation. But the minute you say, supply chain as a supply and demand need where it recognizes that it's about the immediacy or otherwise of everything from toilet rolls on the shelf uh, to will the food be in the supermarkets to will it be delivered it being about demand and your personal demands and, and whether, experience whether those demands can be met and supplied yeah. in the experience within yeah. then it's a very different kind of uh, absolutely very different and conversation. i think we've all, got, we've all got closer to it haven't we with things being delivered to our house you know we're probably the, the person we've seen more than anyone is a dhl delivery guy or the sainsbury's guy you know right. we actually now have a relationship with that we're seeing it which is much much more intuitive mm. So actually the idea of people engaging with it, that work has been done again. It's pushed it forward into a new sphere, a new realm yeah. where engagement is really important. Uh, and just in terms of then calling out a, a couple of um, cheerful examples of uh, proaction of uh, brands and businesses that this isn't about the simple kind of notion of pivoting and all the rest. This is simply more, much more so about how necessity is the mother of invention and what do you do when uh, control is taken away from you and how do you regain control? So if you can't sell sandwiches to people anymore because people can't come into your sandwich shops, can you break down your product offer into its constituent parts and actually operate like a small supermarket chain? And I think what's key here is, you know, we, we're purposefully showing you know, the big behemoth brands who are doing this, you know, who are the who are, you know, large footprints, large supply chains. We all know that at a local level business been very quick to adapt to this, sure. very quick to reconfigure kitchens and way of working. And obviously there are some examples within the fragrance, um, within the fragrance industry where brands are looking at, um, I guess, diversifying or increasing product portfolio or changing the experience. And um, what's interesting here is that the people talk about system breaking, in fact, doing things in a new way. Legacy models would say that Subway 
much like Blockbuster missing out to Netflix, should have been doing this years ago. You have a kitchen which has downtime, you have supply chains, mm -hmm. but actually it takes a, something like yours to, to, to spin you out of it. We call it a pivot, it's a catalyst of change. But actually it's, it's brilliant that business can look at this and go, how can our behaviours change mm -hmm. and how quickly can we do it? Well, something got flipped on its head, that notion yeah. of your core business being 80% of your energy time and investment and 20% devoted to innovation at best, but where there's no immediate short-term revenue. Mm -hmm. Suddenly the 80-20 totally flipped and the 20 became uh, some of my grocery uh, that needs to create new revenue streams very quickly and to do what would have normally been a kind of a classic 12 month gestation of new product or service development into something that could be ready to go and good to go within within literally weeks six weeks yeah uh, another just quick example that we wanted to highlight that we the last call that was in the sunday times back in april when we were all under lockdown um that was really uh, playing to um how to meet the needs of potentially smaller and, and older communities this example being uh, in sweden uh, and from the uh, grocery chain lids uh, the, the headline of the article uh, the times around you know swedes come up with a new take on safe shopping uh, that being with no assistance i mean what's interesting about this if you go to japan actually there's been shops which have been virtual if mm. you like for years because you actually have nobody to fill the shops there are no staff workers there's, sure. there's, <laughs> yeah. there's no one to, there's no one to do the work so actually there um, push was the fact that they didn't actually have people who could be the staff in the stalls. This is one based on COVID and the need for, for well, safety. But exactly. whatever it matters, you meet in the middle where technology solves your problem and provides customers with something they want. Yeah, well, it's a lovely example, example shopping. precisely because it's, it's vending machine retail mm. and supermarket shopping meets local provincial rural environments uh, meeting the needs of, of, a, of, a, of a local community and particularly an aging community and as the, the sort of one of the co-founders of lives puts out this lady here Bia Garcia um, for those higher risk and in risk groups um, therefore the, the, the proposition provides this convenient safe way for uh, local and older audiences to um, you know, mooch down to their local store, get what they want when they need it, 24-7, not have to deal with massive queues or uh, the kind of great soil of humanity piling into the big supermarkets. Well, it's here, so and, they, and they have no problem with that. The assumption is technology for the young as opposed yeah. to technology for the old and those that have actually got some money in these times. Yeah. You know, if I look at my mother who's 75, actually what she's missing out on are the treats and the nice experiences that she could get. If that could be replicated through tech, then there's a, there's a window there. Um, one of the areas we dropped on, uh, we discussed a little bit last week, was a piece of quant research we undertook, which was really trying to get under the skin of supply chain operations and, and, and really how they're transforming and what's shifting there. And some headline stats, um, a couple we shared last week, but some more to come. This idea that of um, those who are within C-suite within business, 78% consider customer experience as part of the supply chain. So as opposed to this idea that's hidden away, that actually customers want to open it up. And if you look at brands like Hakels, who are mm -hmm. completely and utterly transparent in the supply chain from where the seaweed comes and what the packaging is, they almost co create the business. Sure. Actually, people are wanting to be part of that experience and leaning into it. So if anything, currently, time and technology has allowed people to do that. Dovetailed with that is extraordinary and, and rising um, statistics around the idea that 28% are exploring to send customer engagement and post purchase and circular. So, actually, this whole point that supply chain as opposed to supply yeah. system is really what we need to be looking at and where your adaptation will come is going which part of that and which behavior will change to into on board mm. to, to really be making sense of how people will lean into supply chains yeah. and we, 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 what we're saying here really is that the sort of the semantic notion of what supply chain is has to change and is changing the actual construct the model for what supply chain is and how to understand it is changing uh, and understanding that construct uh, that's changing unlocks new ways of looking at the whole um, life cycle of a brand experience and, and the fact that it is a circular one and there's also big challenges come that actually is it a separate PL for separate parts of the supply chain because yeah. you can't break that down you can't make it the thing which is totally linked so you have some mm -hmm. fundamental sort of infrastructure and structural business mm -hmm. problems that mean that you can't address it in the right way therefore circular means post-purchase mm -hmm. after the event as opposed to what it could be which is a much more broader conversation mm -hmm. from sourcing to experience um, a headline stat, which is one we really lodged in our mind, was the idea that you know a good 83% are, are saying that sustainability is, is front and centre in terms of how people can deliver sustainability objectives through technology throughout the supply chain. And so again, a, a, big, a big title of which one could spend you know, half an hour talking about minimum, but actually just thinking there that how can your supply chain be part of that sustainability narrative, which is only becoming more and more important. Well, and, and 
Yes, well, look, under the key word, you know, in other words, there is objectives, mm -hmm. as, as opposed to sustainability being a manifesto or a, um, a rallying cry or a proof point of words, not deeds for organisations. Or well, something to be dealt with. Precisely, you know, <laughs> to tick off because it's a silo piece of the business that at least says that we as an organisation have our cause related piece, you know, down. So that's not the case anymore. That for organisations around the world, what we're ultimately seeing is that the behavioural piece that accompanies the sustainability claims and words, um, meeting of objectives, recognising that technology and supply chain are entry points and to be able to honour objectives and deliver against the kind of organisational purpose sure. and, and be proof, manifest proof points of the brands and company's behaviour. I think that's key, it's the brands and the company's behaviour. Yeah. And, then, and then finally, the idea of um, really business around the world recognising supply chain has become a consumer concern. Mm -hmm. But actually, it's no longer hidden. And we kind of bang the drum and probably over repeating ourselves here a little bit. But actually, the C suite leaders need that customers actively consider your brand as part of the supply chain conversation. So if you can open that up, make a virtue of it, put value into it, demonstrate engagement, wherever that might be, from this is how we source and mm -hmm. this is how we transport, um, I think it's going to become much, 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 much bigger over, over time and how people are choosing the brands they want to work with. And I think we have a. Uh, and, and so this is a, a, a quick one-two slide in terms of if we're talking about historic understanding of how we define the supply chain, what supply chain means to us, the idea of it being something that was very much a, a simple linear construct, it had a start point, it had a hard end point, uh, and it went through uh, a, a series of natural uh, linear sequences from the sourcing ingredients, the origin, yes, it's, which is a much bigger conversation around provenance and, ethic, and ethics, but then very quickly went from the ingredients into manufacturing, the production, the creation of something, the hands that touch it, into a ultimately an inventory and logistics supply, something in transit into ultimately then ordering and fulfillment. It's a very it's a very kind of prosaic and rudimentary way of looking at it. And really what we wanted to do, um, if we're talking about trust, we're talking about supply chains and we're talking about how to unpack it in a way that's meaningful for even very consumer facing around behaviors. Um, the supply chain 360 um, presupposes that at its heart is the opportunity also to introduce technologies that allow for every physical product to have a digital twin. Um, this is again this conversation at IoT and the opportunity to digitize elements of the physical chain um, and the physical experience that create social opportunities. And in the most, and simplistic, and the most simplistic sense, you know, let's, yeah. go, let's go to our bathroom cabinets and our bedside cabinets and look what we've got and everything in our kitchen, every single element within that can create a digital twin and everything else is an opportunity to be a CRM platform. Mm -hmm. it, something in the home has been selected, it's in cool. your home, you own cool. it and obviously with fragrance something you actually allow to cover your body, the most mm -hmm. intimate of uh, relationships in many ways for a product, but actually how do you trigger that, how do you make sense of it and how do you, how do you pull pull from that into it being much yeah. more and, and we'll really bring this to life in the third uh, webinar where, where we're talking very much about then um, activating ways of, of partnering uh, digital technologies uh, with, with physical products to create new, um, kind of, uh, or new, new consumer experiences that are, are that bit more um, ideally remarkable and exciting. So what we've done within this model is to very much unpack it again, yeah. again, something from provenance and traceability and really what does that become a conversation or potentially a conversation about and it can be a multitude of things through to yes, transit and fulfillment are elements obviously still of a 360 supply chain. And I guess the aim here is for anybody who wants to, to, to take these slides and actually look at which parts you can connect, which bits maybe need some scrutiny, which areas you could actually pull out to, to make them consumer facing communications, which bits important to your customer. If it's about brand safety and anti-counterfeiting, we're aware that actually 68% of customers um, wanted to understand about brand safety as a lever to whether they would or would not buy something. If that's a virtue of yours, Make sense of it. Mm. But as we went into lockdown, if you're yeah. Subway Grocer, for example, you know, you, you're looking at this kind of model and going, okay, where do we have opportunities to reference brand safety, ingredients, get brand in hand, product in people's hands, or at their front door? Um, and and there's a big shift from where things were. Yeah, and there's a, 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 a key interview that we undertook, which was a, with a local head of Priestley, who, who was saying, look, it's not what I do know that I worry about, and I also don't want to trust and hope. My worry is about the gaps in time, the spaces in time where I don't know. So if we reflect back to this chart, and you go, actually, this feels like a continuum of understanding provenance and transit fulfillment. It's the gaps in time mm -hmm. where it could be about contamination, could obviously be about counterfeiting. It's the stuff sat on the side of the dock I don't know about. You can make a virtue of that. And obviously for, for um, consumables, this is really, really important. So I want certainty. I want a logistics solution that removes doubt, no more gaps, no more unknowns. And guess what? There's technologies in place that allow you to do that. 
Um, we move around on the, on the slide on the, the supply chain 360 into consumer experience, the fact that actually all these things can be linked, your provenance and traceability can actually be part of your brand storytelling. Um, if at the heart of the, the supply chain 360 model is this notion of technologies allowing for the, the creation of every physical product being a product that's born digital, in part with that is the notion that what we're really putting at the very heart of this model is the consumer and consumer experience. Absolutely. From their you know, understandable concerns and our anxieties over where the product was sourced or the ingredients through to the journey it took to ultimately be something they could purchase, whether in store or delivered to their door, through to the opportunities thereafter. And ultimately, as there is a, the right kind of bludgeon of physical and digital um, supported and sustained by you know, new technology, uh, technological innovations, what we're, we're looking to achieve all the time is a set of con con consumer centric experiences that allow for invitation and participation and a role for that for the, for the user. Indeed. So the final link in that chain is the sustainability angle where actually it becomes a virtual circle. Great product, great, a, great, uh, a great slide to work through um, and, and really interesting to ask some sort of deep questions in the business about how you can make sense in a virtual supply chain. Um, we're going to raffle through because we know where um, time is, as ever, the greatest enemy. Um, a couple of interviews we undertook, which was just to speak to um, one brand, Adidas, and um, try and understand what it means for them. So it, we, we all understand that Adidas have often been at the forefront of engaging in early technologies and making a virtue of that, both at a product level and technological level. Um, but actually the idea that there's no such thing as an individual product lifecycle can be traced was, was a fascinating uh, uh, sort of challenge that they set to us. Mm -hmm. And the, the real here, the need for ever greater self-expression, increasingly conscious shopping behaviours, the attraction of upcycling and recycling, the idea of being a product as a resource for the next product. Sure. It, that, that's the complete and utter evaluation of the 360. Well, well it really is. You know, as we're going around the circle, here we are hitting, hitting the, the notion of, of second lives of products and how actually then the ingredients that composite represent the sum total of that product are in themselves ingredients that are almost like an asset class that can contribute to the creation of the next product it means that ultimately then you're, you're back to brand verification and, and back to the beginning again. yeah so these are th these are stories which you may have read and may have looked at but actually if we get to the theory into the practice if you take the wheel you can start looking at how a product like the future craft loop sneaker with adidas is something which could be overlaid into into the fragrance um, uh, category as well where the products and ingredients form part of the future. The packaging itself can move into some other area. But actually what you're doing is you're taking the entire supply chain and making a genuine mm -hmm. virtue of it. Yeah, and um, uh, another um, brand practitioner at um, Adidas really called this out in, in our panel, our leaders panels interviews. Uh, this, one's, this one's from April this year. Um, at the end of the day, the idea of technology supporting new consumer experiences and new brand narratives, um, all that does, ultimately as well is, is be compelling for the organization because it creates not only new competitive advantages but it creates new revenue streams absolutely so we're into uh, very very aware that we're coming up to the 11, be 11 bells and we're into two slides of closing of, of, of cl closing uh, if anything can be taken away from this session what we'd like to be taken away now is not the time to sort of rest on formal laurels and formal conventional practices. It's no, no moment in time to place our faith and understanding that what worked last year or has worked for the last 10 years will continue to work. Because, of course, the context shift is, is so considerable. Sure. So that the notion that uh, convention, you know, conventional practices aren't really what they once were. Um, established wisdom, now disrupted, no longer quite so wise. Proven practices, the idea that they are proof points, no longer carrying the same weight of, of, of proof and exhibited evidence. Um, old normal, new normal, old different. It's a contextual shift, however you looked at it. And Isn't so the reality that everybody will be putting everybody else under some serious scrutiny for what you're doing to adapt and deliver new and different based on the prevailing winds and what's, what's occurring out there culturally in society. Exactly. And, and so ultimately, the idea of uh, trying something new and it being something of inherent risk has reversed. So trying something new is the least risky route to mm -hmm. take. Of all organisations running to the sort of self-imposed mantra of, you know, how are, we, how are we looking to continue to invent and reinvent to create you know, the better in the mouse trap you know, so people can do the path of that? Or you know, how are we moving forward? How are we trialing, refining, revising, rapid prototyping? What are we doing differently? Not because it represents 20% anymore, but yeah, where it potentially it comes very quickly our 80% of tomorrow. Or the everything. Yeah. Um, and so um, it leads us to say before the. Uh, the chimes come in for 11 o'clock. Um, a great thanks to Linda and team at the Fragrance Foundation for the chance to speak to the uh, membership. We will be um, up on stage again next week um, for our session about Thrive, which is how can you actually grow and benefit from some of the rules that we've talked about um, in the last uh, two webinars. So 
thanks from us. Uh, the presentation will be up later on. Um, and feel free to uh, reach out to us if there's anything you'd like to talk about. Take care. Have a good day. Take thanks, care. Thanks, guys. And the clock chimes. <laughs>